Good evening and a very warm welcome to all. Thank you for joining us for the seventh and the last webinar session of Zootopia 2021, the national level com open design competition. I hope all those who have joined are hail and hearty. The Central Zoo Authority, in collaboration with the Atal Innovation Mission, Niti Aayog launched Zootopia 2021 in an attempt to involve the young creative minds of our nation in developing an interpretation center for an Indian zoo. The series of webinars and the panel discussions with the subject matter have been planned to spread the importance of zoo design and planning in the field of architecture, planning, design, and also communicate the need and importance of a holistic view of a multidisciplinary approach. Today's session is dedicated to resilience in zoos from the imagination to innovation. We have four accomplished speakers uh, for the session today. Mr. Piyush Sheksarya from the World Bank, Ms. Ditta Satish from Srishti Manipal Institute of Art, Design and Technology, Dr. Shuchan Rabardhan from Jadavpur University, Kolkata, from Malch, uh, Malch, Ms. Malchri Joshi, from found, uh, she's a founding partner at Space Matters. To start the session, I would like to invite Mr. Piyush Sheksarya. He's a disaster risk management specialist in World Bank, he has a master's in architecture, Crater, France, and an MPhil in geography, Sorbonne, Paris. His current area of work involves post-disaster housing reconstruction, multipurpose evacuations, shelters, and community-based disaster risk management. Additionally, he has been working on developing nature-based approaches to building resilience. Over to you, sir. So you're on mute. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, very interesting series. Without any delay, I'll um, start my presentation. Let me know if you all can see it. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir, yes. we can. Okay. So um, I've titled my uh, presentation, uh, Where Did My Hippo Go? And actually, um, Although the image uh, also talks of a similar scenario that I'm going to narrate to you in a little more detail. But here, what you're seeing is a hippo in the Tbilisi Zoo in Georgia. Uh, the zoo or the city was hit by floods and a number of animals were lost and a number of them actually just escaped. And uh, the hippo actually, actually had to be sedated. And here you can see zoo officials uh, who are pushing the sedated hippo back to his enclosure. We had a uh, interesting incident, which I'll talk about next slide onwards. So I'm not sure how many of you remember, but in October 2014, uh, cyclone Hoodhood hit Vishakapatnam. We've had a number of cyclones in just the recent weeks. Cyclone Taute that hit the Western coast. Um, and we had um, cyclone Yas uh, that hit West Bengal. So uh, even for a person who's not necessarily interested in cyclones or uh, such disasters, we've noticed that cyclones have become actually a very regular phenomenon, not just on the East Coast, which was the tradition, but now increasingly on the West Coast. And while obviously for obvious reasons, it's people, lives lost, uh, damage to property that takes uh, forefront, the same cyclones also hit facilities like zoos. So the image on the left is actually Cyclone Hudu, uh, which was classified as a very severe cyclonic storm. It did its landfall uh, on the 12th of October and wind speeds were up to 185 kilometers per hour. And I can assure you that these wind speeds one cannot imagine unless one actually has lived through them. And just as it devastated the city of Vishakhapatnam and the surroundings, it actually badly hit the Vishakhapatnam Zoo. And the two images on the right, one shows the entrance of the zoo and one shows the interiors. It's a very large establishment and it was completely devastated. Added to which the eye of the cyclone, which is the center here, actually landed. We call it the landfall when this eye reaches land, that is the post it actually ripped through the zoo. So it was a coincidence of, of grave proportions for the zoo that the landfall actually happened at the zoo site. 
and I had the opportunity of working post Hodo uh, in Andhra Pradesh and also on this particular zoo. And there was a very interesting story uh, that one of the zookeepers told us about. They had a hippo, and I can't remember the name, but the name was a very Indian non-hippo like name, something like Ganesh or Rama or something like that. And um, the cyclone hit the zoo in the night, and all the zookeepers were, of course, themselves um, in danger, so they didn't step out for the night. But when they went in the morning looking for the animals, the hippo keeper found that the hippo wasn't in the enclosure. The cyclone winds had knocked off the boundary wall and the hippo wasn't indoors. And really worried, he started looking for the hippo around and sort of followed um, a path that the hippo had made to find the hippo uh, very quietly grazing in the neighborhood uh, housing complex. And, you know, as I was getting really excited and stressed about how they handled the situation, the zookeeper tells me that, oh, I just called him. Ganesh, Ganesh, and the hippo followed me back into the zoo. So, well, that particular incident ended well, fortunately for the hippo, the citizens of Vishakapatnam, but that's very often not the case for wildlife, but also for people. Uh, I'm going to now run you through, um, well, I'm not going to really run through the, through the map of the zoo of India, but this is the location of the Vishakapatnam Zoo. It's one of the large zoos in India. And I'm going to show you how it is placed with respect to some of the common disasters slash hazards that we face. So the so this is the flood map, and you can see that it's relatively okay as far as floods are concerned. This is the cyclone map, and obviously it's bang in the middle, uh, very high cyclone uh, risk. Wind hazard map, and you can see that it's right there, and it's not really so subject to earthquake. These, of course, are just a selection of the kind of hazards we face. We have a number of others, some of which may be highly localized, and some of which may not be in the so-called natural uh, hazard category. The four that I've chosen are fall into the natural hazard category. And the fact is that there's no such thing actually as natural disaster. There are only natural hazards. And I'm going to try and explain to you how one can discern the difference between the two. Okay. So on the left, we see an active volcano. It's virtually a site which has seems to have no human habitation. It has some natural forest. And there is the, the volcano is live. It obviously causes damage to this forest, but no people, property, and in that sense, zoos are affected. Over a period of time, it goes dormant, and slowly, we start building, and the city grows into the mountain, and one fine day, it erupts, and you can imagine the kind of damage. So, while this is a hazard, what you're seeing here is a disaster, and in some ways, we have played a role in turning this hazard into a disaster. I'm going to take another example, uh, maybe a little more fun example uh, for you all to try and visualize better. So here we see an overhang. The overhang has a little tree growing under it. The tree seems to be in fine uh, in a fine location, but there is a boulder at this edge, and it seems like it's going to topple over, and it does. It does, but because the tree is under the overhang, there's nothing else here, there is no disaster. There's no damage, there's no problem. Now, we see that the scenario is similar, but we have the presence of a human being, and somebody feels that, you know, it's an area where people are hanging out, maybe going up for picnics, and we need to remove this loose boulder. So here, we've removed the hazard, and there is very little chance of any kind of disaster happening. I also want you all to pay attention to this Venn diagram. It's only when hazard, exposure, and vulnerability mix together that you form risk. So try and understand what are these elements. It may be a little difficult to get away straight uh, in the first shot, but it will help you to understand this better. And here you see that 
They didn't remove the boulder. The picnickers kept coming. And one day, there was a disaster. And here we see that this person was actually thinking of a solution of sorts, which was building a shelter for himself, but it was too late. And here, while he builds a little shelter, it isn't exactly that he's completely at risk safety because when the boulder falls, although he may be saved, his house is damaged. So just a set of illustrations to try and indicate to you that not every hazard results in a risk, sorry, results in a disaster, but by exposing oneself, by being vulnerable to the situation, one can end up in a disaster scenario. Now I'm going to run you through uh, some images uh, that I was able to collect from the net, uh, which gives you some impression of what happens to zoos uh, in the time of disasters. We remain with cyclones for now. Uh, this is the zoo in Chennai. It's one of the largest zoos in the country. And uh, you know that Chennai is, um, and the Tamil Nadu coast is often hit by cyclones. And right from this information board to trees uh, falling on animal shelters, to a whole range of tree clearing that has to be undertaken post the cyclone, and the whole system getting uh, disrupted. Zoos can really face a major issue in a natural event of this sort. And often um, there isn't enough preparedness, there isn't enough capacity, there isn't enough knowledge of what needs to be done to be better uh, prepared in a scenario like this. This is uh, the case of Cyclone Bulbul uh, from Dalipur Zoo in Calcutta. And this is a very, uh, this is a highly endangered species called the Sangai. Uh, found um, naturally only, I think, in one lake system in Manipur, the Loktak. Um, and uh, the young one was born on the day of the cyclone. So zoos are living systems. Every day, irrespective of the cyclone and emergency, it's a holiday, there's a riot, whatever it may be. Animals have to be fed, animals are unwell, then young ones being born. So it it's a 24-7 job. This is another unfortunate case where um, a paper candle, uh, a paper lantern, so your lantern was lit and released in the sky celebrating New Year's, and it ended up and landed in this uh, primate enclosure in the Kreffel Zoo in Germany, uh, and the whole enclosure burned down. A number of their uh, primates died. Another example of a fairly common incident of fire that happens uh, even in our houses and cities, and zoos remain highly susceptible to these kind of situations. And this very uh, charming image is actually in the Miami Zoo. Uh, Miami um, is a coast along the coastline which is highly affected by hurricanes. And here, um, 50 Caribbean flamingos have been uh, sheltered in what is actually a public toilet. And you can see it's been well prepared, there's grass at the bottom, and um, maybe um, the flamingos are taking advantage of the mirror and sort of curious by what it means to see so many more flamingos than what they're used to. But this is a common, uh, common occurrence along certain coasts, and zoos uh, are often well aware of the risks uh, their animals suffer. Now, I'm actually uh, not sure how I'm doing on time, but um, this is, I'm going to leave you with this slide, is that not everything is bad or not everything is, uh, you know, a response. It's not that we have to uh, fight the fire when the fire is lit. Uh, by taking uh, a risk-informed systems-based approach, which includes, of course, design, design thinking, uh, we can, or we have to rather, uh, turn disasters into um, something that we have far better handle on. Um, and of course, this studio is more on the integration design related uh, part of Zoom, uh, Zoos, but uh, 
um, irrespective of whatever you design, whatever you think of, you think of what are the kind of hazards uh, your zoo is likely to face within a certain time frame. It shouldn't be just something that happens, a big ticket happen, event that happens once in 20 years, but it should also be small events that happen on a regular basis. And looking at the future, because as you know, uh, climate change is impacting the way things are happening today and things are changing rapidly. If you look at the western coast of India now, we are almost sure that we are going to have cyclonic events every year. There's extensive erosion, sea level rise, uh, temperatures are going up, there are extreme rain events, and so on. So while planning for zoos, you have to look at the future um, and looking at hazards and the changing profile of hazards would ensure that the future we create is more resilient. Um, there's lots of reading, reading material out there. I'm just suggesting a couple of um, documents that I found pretty good. Uh, one is an assessment for the National uh, Zoo, and another one is a model disaster management plan for zoos of India. You find them easily on the internet. And with that, thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable inputs. I will now invite Ms. Deepta Satish. She is a design researcher, educator, architect, and planner working in landscapes in conflict. Her environmental practice is focused on creating new pathways in design, education, and policy. Her current research in the Western Ghats of India gathers wet ontologies, situated practices, movement, and the politics of the colonial eye and draws from design, environmental, humanities, and philosophy. She is the director and the founder of Oud Center for Design Research in Monsoon Terrains and Dean of Research and Collaborations at Srishti Manipal Institute of Art, Design and Technology. At the center, Deepta conceptualizes and facilitates design research in the areas of conservation, futures, more than human worlds and monsoon uh, landscapes. The research involves studios and projects for the postgraduate learners in collaboration with communities, NGOs, scholars, and government organizations. The projects concerned with the environment and its inhabitants are oriented towards revealing and generating new possibilities and frameworks for natural cultural synchronicities. Her place-based pedagogical approach is anchored in design practices and humanities to imagine ways of seeing, understanding, and engaging in worlds in conflict, uh, in flux. She is senior advisor at the Forum for Law, Environment, Development, and Governance, member of IUC and Commission of Education and Communication, and co-editor of the book Product Service System Design for Sustainability, a collaboration of EU Asia Link Program, Learning Network on Sustainability. She is also a dancer, wanderer, and photographer. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Gargi. Um, and thank you for all for inviting me to this uh, really interesting event for the, for the competition of the Interpretation Center. Um, I will just quickly jump into and share my screen. And I hope this will work properly. Um, so uh, is it visible? Uh, two minutes. It's, it's almost there. It's not visible yet. Um, let me just uh, try. Yes, yeah. it was visible. Yes. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. Okay, super. Um, so, um, what I thought I would talk about, um, apart, you know, I, I think um, uh, Mr. Sixaria really spoke about disasters in a really um, interesting manner, and I sort of, I suppose, I want to um, shift gears um, into perhaps looking at the idea of being inventive, um, and I think the session is really about imagining new things um, and also trying to be a lot more creative in the aspects of you know how do we think about interpretation interpretation centers and what does design mean in that frame and so i i wanted to sort of respond to those ideas um so 
Um, usually, interpretation centers are, you know, they're 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 they house information that's created from disciplinary understanding. So it's botany, zoology, um, you know, all the sciences, environmental sciences, and it's a lot of what they teach us in school as well. Um, and here, animals and plants are organized in classification systems, and this is the kind of information we gather from interpretation centers. Uh, by and large, most interpretation centers uh, sort of begin with this framing. Um, and ecologies are organized into landscapes and spaces from forests to grasslands to rivers and mountains. Um, and of course, the people who are creating this, uh, these interpretation centers are usually the experts of all kinds from the sciences, but also um, as architects who are designing the spaces. And, um, and, and the people who are using it are considered lay people. So, what I'd like to do is I'd like to suggest that there are other ways um, of knowing the world that is not just from um, from information that's being fed that's already processed from uh, a whole different set of understandings from science. But how do we actually engage with the world through these kinds of centers? Um, so I would like to suggest that interpretation is not just reading information, nor is it just remembering facts about things and places and, um, and animals and biota that we engage with. Um, but it's really about an experience. Um, it's about an engaged understanding. And some of these things can be seen in some interpretation centers across the world where there are interactive kinds of spaces. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really about meaning making for the person who's experiencing these places. Um, and so interpretation then becomes fundamental to knowledge making, um, not just knowledge transmission, but it's how, I, how one would understand something by engaging in this kind of a space. Um, so to that effect, um, I want to sort of respond to where design stands in this as well, but usually design is seen as problem solving um, and design generally borrows data from other disciplines to then solve these problems. But I would like to sort of suggest a shift again here. The design is really a practice of imagining, imag you know, imaginative practice. It's about creativity. It's about being inventive as well. And it's about embracing complexity and being sensitive to the context to the place, to the um, to the challenge, actually, that is uh, that is up ahead, and so it becomes a prob proposition as opposed to a solution. Um, and in this particular case for interpretation centers, it really begins with engaging in ecologies or imagining that engagement in ecologies, um, and so. I want to now shift from design into perhaps um, the actual design of an interpretation center. Um, and in general, uh, we sort of see one is that we see, see interpretation centers as architectural propositions. Um, and architecture is, by and large, I'm an architect, but um, by and large, it's about dividing spaces. Um, you know, we sort of make drawings that divide this room from that room um, or this experience from that experience, and the lines are drawn into plans and sections. But what, and, and of course, the experience also then gets segregated. Um, and um, so, so experiences are not necessarily fluid in that sense or, um, or explorative in that manner. So then, you know, so. So then we can ask the question, where does, where does this experience begin? Where does, um, where does the landscape begin? And the landscape, I mean, off the interpretation center, perhaps where it is situated um, and what it does in that place and what it contributes to the larger um, ecology it's situated in. Um, and so can we then draw lines that connect as opposed to things that divide? And I think this is where design really becomes important and inventive in that sense. Um, and it's really about reading patterns um, of looking at materials, earth, atmosphere, inhabitants, looking at tracing rhythms, weaving different kinds of ideas and forms that are not necessarily always uh, pakka, but could be pacha in some sense or a combination of the two. Um, and it's also about embracing complexity. It's, um, it's not about analysis always to sort of divide things up, but how can we sort of bring things together as a complex experience um, in order to really engage in, in the activities or engage in, um, in the activity of interpreting something. And so this would 
contribute perhaps not only just to a spatial design, but also to designing the exhibits and the things that people will engage with within an interpretation center for interpreting as opposed to for consumption of information. And so this really is about placemaking because you want people to remember their experiences. Um, you want people to come back um, for something new perhaps. And so um, can we consider site situatedness look at really not just inhabitants and animals, but really em sort of embed oneself as a designer or a creative practitioner trying to think of these kinds of spaces in a more than human sense. Um, can we be the animal? Can we be the plot? Can we be the atmosphere? Um, and in that sense, um, also to consider orientation, not as direction of a building, but also to orient oneself as the designer, as embedded, as an experiencer, as an inhabitant of the place. Um, and so then can we inhabit these dynamic environments? And then what does that mean to create a dynamic environment of an interpretation center? And here I want to sort of suggest that there are, you know, that we sort of think about the city, that a particular place can be many things, or a thing can be many places in that sense. And so I'm just going to go through a bunch of visuals as well. Um, but what I'd like to also just touch upon a lot more, which is more important, I think, is four different aspects of placemaking, um, which is really about spatiality, which is, you know, spatial appropriation, as opposed to space, which is a fixed thing, whereas, um, and then materials and materiality, time and temporality, because places change over time, over seasons. And of course, the experience of these places is through movement. It is about walking and engaging and touching and smelling. And, um, and it's not really uh, necessarily about um, objects, but it's about being in it and imbibing. So absorbing things and releasing ideas. Absor and it's really about a conceptual framework, but that also then can translate into a physical reality. And so can this place, that, um, that is being considered for design, live, breathe, change with time and perhaps even correspond with seasons, with the different practices of the inhabitants and the biota that it's actually um, sharing, um, sharing, I guess, life stories of perhaps. Um, and so in terms of spatial appropriation, um, we don't always have to design from a plan view. We can think about sectional views. We can think about how um, you know, different kinds of ecologies connect with each other over time. Uh, we can also think about the different kinds of um, the transitions between ecologies from, you know, ocean to coast to escarpment to plateau, for example, and this is free of the Western Ghats as an example. But that would en enable us to look at different materials and engage with that, which is water, soil, rock. Um, and these are really intrinsic to um, creating habitats and ecologies for for animals and other creatures to to um, to survive on, um, and this is really an image of about about how we can we can actually start to design without drawing a plan, but we can actually sort of map out different trajectories of um, of practices of different creatures. Um, for example, even the hippo, right? The hippo can swim, so where does it move? How does it move? And then just taking off from. Uh, Sixaria's work. Um, and so can we think of movement then? And I'll come to that as well. But if we look at materiality, materials change over time. When it rains, earth shifts, um, rocks crumble. Um, there's a whole transformative process that happens over the seasons. Um, and, and there's a hardening that happens. The fire burns and hardens things. It also helps germination. So can we think of these kinds of processes and the inhabitants that rely on these processes? So um, so the idea is to think of, when I say more than human, it's not just about the animals, but it's about their ecologies and their dependent interdependencies. Um, and can these kinds of interdependencies then become part of a design exercise? Um, and this is again a visual of how soil changes, um, not just with water, but with different kinds of materials and also um, how uh, when human intervention happens, what happens to these materials as well. Um, and here is an example of laterite, um, where there's an image here of the rock itself, but then there is a whole geological understanding and the inhabitants above. Um, but then there's also this artistic ability of, of trying to interpret or understand how, these, how this rock actually uh, behaves. And within these holes, it's 
these are actually habitats for all kinds of creatures to, to, to dwell in and to move through. Um, and so can we start to think, bring in this kind of complexity? Um, and then of course this time, uh, which, which involves um, a responding to time, uh, where we look at um, you know, change uh, of, of the earth, of the atmosphere, of people, inhabitants of, of uh, you know, arboreal creatures all the way to aquatic creatures and really sort of look at the depth of the world as opposed to just looking at, a, at, at surface inhabitants and then how do we actually look at um, depth. And so this would actually mean a voluminous understanding of space as well. And can these ideas then become part of the design of an interpretation center is the question. Um, and, um, and then there's movement in the sense that, you know, creatures move. Uh, can, we, can we draw from the way they move to actually thinking about how can we, um, how, can, how can the design of an experience moving through this space of, of an interpretive sensor actually be meaningful? Um, and so one of the things is that we move in different ways. Um, our bodies navigate to things that we are uh, alert to. So if a particular space becomes open, uh, can we move through that in a particular way and experience something and move again from there? And this is really about, you know, and different parts of us move differently. So how can spatial um, design actually accommodate these kinds of multiple kinds of movements? Um, and these are just visuals of how we can sort of think about um, the, the act of designing um, and, and designing movement through space. And this is what I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that we look at movement, which is different from circulation. Circulation is embedded within an already designed space or an already predetermined space. Whereas can we think of space after thinking about how movement occurs? So it's really flipping the order of, um, of how we design. And so in that sense, I would like to suggest that design is really responsive to the context, to the environment, to the, um, kinds of things that we're trying to, um, that, the, that, the, that the center is actually trying to respond to. Um, and design becomes inclusive of change. So can the center actually transform physically, materially, experientially um, across time, across seasons, um, and actually embrace the complexity of these kinds of uh, changes that occur? And then can it be participative? with the inhabitants, and inhabitants I mean by those of the zoo, but also what we call the visitors. But if I'm a frequent visitor, I'm no longer just a visitor. I'm actually an inhabitant and a participant in the making of the, of the interpretation center, but also a participant in the activities of the, the zoological gardens themselves. So to conclude, I just want to suggest that design is really about imagining and imaging um, the new. Um, and the new as a challenge proposition, and not as a problem to solve. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, so I'd like to just close there. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for explaining each and every details and the elements that are essential to design and can guide our design from imagination to innovation. Thank you so much. Our, next, our third presenter for the evening is Dr. Shuchandra Bardhan. Dr. Bardhan is an architect with Masters in Landscape Architecture and P, um, PhD. She is a professor at the Architecture Department of Jadhpur University, Kolkata. Professor Bardhan has been a two-time visiting academic at the BLA program, Department of Architecture, University of Moratuwa, Sri Lanka, under the India Sri Lanka Foundation in 2014 and 2018. She is associated with Rona as an honorary director of landscape. With research interests in the field of sustainability, environment, built and natural heritage, illumination design, etc., she has been national, international publications to her credit and had been joint recipient of the Best Paper Award at the 24th European Photovoltaic so uh, Solar Energy Conference in 2009. On professional front, she has worked on a range of architectural and landscape design projects covering diverse typologies and scales and had been one of the core team member of Jadavpur University Special Multidisciplinary 
applied research teams part for preparation of the comprehensive rejuvenation plan of Kolkata's Rabindra Charbor, a national league based on which the recent landscape restoration works have been implemented. Over to you, ma'am. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Thank you. Uh, so a very good evening to everyone. At the very outset, I would like to thank Dr. Shonali Ghosh for inviting me on this platform. And also would like to congratulate the organizers for conceptualizing such an interesting competition for the students, as well as planning the webinar series for them, which is a very innovative idea in itself. Uh, coming to my presentation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Gargi. Yeah. Thanks, Gargi. It's visible. Yeah. I have titled my presentation as Towards Zoo Logical Promoting Biophilia, suggesting the essence of this exercise as I understand it to be. Since the submission deadline is a few days from now, I shall be sharing my thoughts focused on the academic thinking on the design of the interpretation center with a few real life examples from around the world put together for this presentation. The idea is to help the students and the participants to add last moment tweaking and fine tuning of their entries. Uh, there could be some obviously inevitable overlaps with the past presentations, but that would only mean that these points are extremely important. Next slide, please. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Is it visible to everybody? Uh, yeah, now it's visible. Yeah, so I would like to begin with the larger picture of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 2017, in short, SDG 17 especially the goal numbers 11, uh, 14, and 15, which are sustainable cities and uh, communities, life below water, life on land, as well as uh, the fact that the UN has uh, declared this decade to be as that of ecosystem restoration. So this motivates us to rethink and relook at nature for solutions to our anthropogenic problems so both of these align extremely well with the objectives of the zoological parks as well as that of the competition. Next, if we look at the goal number 11, that is the sustainable cities and communities, we see several cross-cutting issues like the urban heat island effect, the loss of urban greenery and biodiversity, degraded urban ecology on one hand, global warming, climate change uh, issues, air, water pollution, and so on. So um, uh, here, what uh, you see, if we address one, the others also get adequately addressed because of the co-benefits that, uh, uh, that this process actually generates. For example, zoological and as well as botanical gardens are rich repositories of plant resources. These contribute to pollution abatement and climate regulation by carbon storage and cooling effects of the vegetation. And these are also biodiversity hotspots. So other than wildlife conservation and research come educational goals, these protected areas, the zoological parks and the botanical gardens, these also serve as significant green infrastructure, one that plays a larger role. So with robust design based on ecological approach, the biophilic environment in the zoos can offer both ecosystem as well as human psychological resilience. Next slide. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay, so coming to the actual subject of design, let us first refer to the dictionary meaning of interpretation once again, which is action of explaining the meaning of something, the way something is explained or understood. Now, what is this something? Generating ideas towards this something could be the first step in design. 
assuming that the students are already in advanced stages of their design, they could still restructure their thoughts under these three simple generic formats, context, concept, and content. Context is the overarching one and includes all related background studies, research into the subject as well as site, and helps in framing the design brief. Concept is the central key idea, that is the spark, based on which the content is developed and helps in setting the stage for one or more curatorial narratives and strategies, that is the actual ideation or theming. And content is the assimilation of the context and the concept woven around the concept, but makes practical adjustments, tries to understand the scope and limitations provided by the building and the site, in this case, the heritage building, and plan out the three A's, that is the attractions, activities, and amenities required for appropriate interpretation. Analogically speaking, context is the ground, concept is the seed, and content is the tree, having the potential of growing into a magnificent one if treated and nurtured well. Content also includes resolving the tectonics, that is the material and the technical aspects, while representation is how the idea is communicated based on scientific information and facts expressed through art, technology, or a mix of two. And infographics plays a very important role over here. Uh, so next slide, next slide, please. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Taking a little time, I guess. Can you see now? Uh, no movement at my end. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So these two examples are to elaborate on the concept to reality process. I was associated with both these projects of Drona and Dr. Shikha Jain, uh, who had made her presentation in one of the webinars, she had also mentioned uh, both of these projects in her talk. One is the Buddhist Cultural Park at Sachi, and the other is the award-winning India Garden Project of Beijing. Sachi is an, an iconic Buddhist site. So our design concept was based on philosophy, symbolism, and association values related to Lord Buddha's life and teachings. For symbolism-based concepts, the challenge lies in translating it in physical terms. In this case, the four main events of Buddha's life have been depicted through the four trees associated with these events. That is birth, enlightenment, first sermon, and the Mahapari Nirvana. And the zone was named Buddha Jivan Parikrama, which on the screen you see on the right hand side top. And on the uh, left hand side, uh, the three views of the pavilions, these represented the three noble truths because the other theme was based on the first sermon itself, that is the Dharma Chakra Pravartana Sutra or the four noble truths. The first three noble truths were expressed through these pavilions, which you see here in, uh, in the form of presentation drawings, reflect the essence of these teachings through visual qualities of these pavilions as well as their surroundings. The fourth one, that is the eightfold path, was depicted through eight freestanding columns with lotus engravings. The picture that you see here uh, in the bottom middle uh, is the uh, was the actual proposition, but then during implementation, these uh, freestanding columns were pushed a little inland. And the photograph in the middle on top shows the actual site photograph of one of the truth pavilions. So this is an example of how a philosophy-based concept was translated in real life. And it is also important to note that Buddhist teachings are very relevant to zoological parks itself because it encompasses universal compassion for one and all. 
Okay. Now the other one, which is at the left, um, uh, sorry, the right bottom corner, the India Garden. In this case, we uh, followed the concept of uh, the physico-spatial aspects of the country. That is the uh, uh, three sides. We have ocean and we have the Himalayas on the north. And in this case, a similar speciality was um, included in the layout and uh, uh, it had moats on three sides and there was a height which was proposed and also implemented towards the north, northern part of the site. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Yes. Yeah. So here uh, we have themes that are more function oriented and both proposals are in West Bengal. The top two pictures that you see are the proposed entry zone of a zoological park where shade was provided by a green roof canopy put up on a structure having a semblance of a tree for natural appearance. And the bottom two uh, pictures that you see are uh, uh, belongs to an inter outdoor interpretation proposition consisting of a boardwalk and intermittent pause points facing the river and the forest alternately. And in both these cases, bamboos and woods were profusely used as uh, uh, materials, proposed materials. Next, next slide. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so here we move on to the special something. That special something, what are the possibilities and the option of those certain things needed for interpretation? And this is an example from Morris Arboretum where a scaled up robin's nest was created with willow sticks with eggs proportionate to the nest. And this is so interesting as children can directly access the nest. As you can see, it is suspended from top of a canopy walk and uh, they can experience it, how the nest looks from inside and feels from inside and can directly engage with it. And pruned tree branches, if uh, students would like to recreate it in some form or the other in the proposed uh, interpretation center, then they can also use the uh, pruned branches of the trees that are present in the zoological park itself. So that makes a very strong sustainability statement as well. Next slide. Yes, ma'am. So this is an example how children can be engaged uh, with, uh, uh, you know, interpretation uh, panels. Here we have on the left hand side uh, an example from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, a uh, larger than life um, environmental graphics where the color and the texture of the feathers of the bird species uh, any of the bird species can be chosen uh, were depicted and uh, it it helps in appreciation of the species and on the left hand side we have the bear paws and the jaw these give an idea of the scale of the species and children can learn from comparing with themselves and uh, also taking a cue from the snake and ladder game that we have a know-how on the reptiles may also be created. Okay, next. Yes, ma'am. Yes, now here, uh, this is a bit of theory. Here I present a broad framework of general design considerations that in my view, the students may use as a checklist in their design process. So on the left hand side, we have the qualitative aspects on the right hand side, the quantitative aspects. Of course, these are not a exhaustive, but a general overview of the uh, important considerations. So we have the special articulation and quality of spaces, treatment of all the planes in the room. So the, not only the walls, but also the floor and the ceilings are also important. Then one has to plan for the visitor movement to check which space should come first and which next and what should be the sequence. Local culture and traditions are very important. Local materials, sourcing from a local region or at least the site, maybe those should be taken into account. Then the aesthetics with the seven visual qualities. 
and uh, out of which color is of course the uh, very important dimension color with all its uh, you know hue value and intensity all these play a very important role then of course light i can't stress enough how important light is and in my subsequent slides i'll be explaining more on that then we have symbolism representation and association values which i explained through the previous slides that of buddhist cultural park and then retention of information, like how you actually, uh, when the visitor uh, goes and uh, uh, sees the text around of the interpretation center and comes out and how long uh, he or she, the child uh, maybe retains the memory of what uh, they learned inside. So that is important. How can we increase that? And research says that engaging most of the senses at a given point of time actually helps in improvement of retention. Coming to the quantitative aspects, we have the space functionalities, the efficiency of space use, and the carrying capacity. What I mean by carrying capacity is uh, the students may think about how many uh, visitors they may allow at a given point of time in one space. So that's the limiting uh, number of visitors in a particular space at a, at a given point of time. Next, we come to, of course, the dimensional aspects the, of the displays of the font and the sizing, the variation in sizes based on the heights and the distance of viewing, the spacing, etc. Resource optimization, of course, it's very important if we are going for uh, technological means and energy is required. So how do we optimize the use of energy and as well as material, of course, and uh, what if there's uh, some waste generated, whether we can reuse it at site or not. Retrofitting, because the building concerned is already um, having some sort of services, I guess, but then those need to be augmented with retrofitting and optimization of the services is required. Their efficiency is also required to be established and renewable energy integration, if possible, would definitely add uh, some extra point. Then we come to the illumination quantity in terms of this. So we can say that the brightness of light and what kind of uh, light source, luminaire we are using, that is important. Lighting power density, which is given by LPD, that may also be considered. Then economy and cost efficiency, and finally maintainability and ease of operation. operation. So these are the aspects which need to be seen. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, ma'am. Now, uh, this is where I uh, would like to explain the importance of light in an indoor space because the students are having to design the interpretation center within a given uh, heritage building that I understand. Uh, this is a very beautiful example of a flamingo habitat in the Swiss National Muse Museum showing a combination of special organization light quality, color with all its dimensions, and material on all this material, particularly in two-dimensional and three-dimensional formats. The abstraction of the wetland vegetations that you see here in the form of the sticks and the boardwalk that goes beyond the visual frame create a sense of mystery and invite at the same time and transfers the otherwise ordinary interior into an exploratory sense of Hereness and thereness. So even within the space, you have a uh, something there. That's the boardwalk and the wetland, and the here that is from where the visitors are being able to watch the scene. Okay. So next slide again. Yes, sir. Yes, this is the waterways gallery at Milan Museum, uh, the Museum of uh, Science and Technology, where an illusion of water has been created on the floor. So there, the, the floor has not been changed in any way. It is just an illusion created by appropriate uh, illumination, choice of luminaire and light source. And uh, this is also something that can be explored if you want to show life under uh, water then this is a very this could be a very um, exciting technology to incorporate within the interpretation center without much change it's only through uh, illumination so next slide again yes yeah, yeah. now this is my favorite this many of you might be knowing that this is the award-winning photograph clicked by ashwarya sridhar 
who won the National History Museum's Photographer of the Year Award last year, where this tree in the middle of the forest is completely covered by fireflies captured in Maharashtra, in a forest in Maharashtra. Now, this bioluminescence that we find in nature is unique, and this particular way of, you know, fireflies covering the tree is probably typical of Indian scenario and so brilliantly captured by the photographers. This inspired me to show it here, share with the participants, wondering if this can be artificially recreated in one of the halls in the interpretation center, combined with appropriate soundscapes, maybe, you know, those of the cricket and uh, crickets and uh, create a mesmerizing, magical, uh, spectacular and captivating night scape. Uh, the night atmosphere could be, you know, one of the main draws and USP as most of us don't have that uh, typical night in the forest experience in real life. And most of the uh, most of us, meaning most of us city dwellers. Next slide, please. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Then one may also explore the possibilities of moonlighting. Moonlighting in forest is yet another spectacle. And uh, um, although the scale would be difficult uh, or rather challenging to achieve uh, indoor, but maybe explored in some way or the other if it's possible to recreate. And on the right hand side, we have this um, temporary installation with uh, disposed of uh, plastic bottles assembled in the form of a Christmas tree. And this drives the message of, uh, you know, reuse and recycling by use of waste materials. Next. Yes, ma'am. So these were all visual perceptions and uh, uh, it's almost my la last slide here. I would like to stress on the non-visual perceptions, um, uh, which include, of course, the touch and the tactile quality, the tactile texture of the foliage and the barks and a whole new, you know, wetland system could be put on a 3D panel. This could be allowed to touch and used uh, for paper rubbing by the children. And uh, the left hand side photograph is one of my projects in Dalhousie Square where uh, signage had been created uh, in brass and uh, Braille uh, script has been also in inserted so that it is uh, truly inclusive, visually challenged people can also read, not only touch and feel the form of the overall uh, space, but also uh, read what's written. So this will uh, definitely make it more, make the universal, uh, make the interpretation center universal as well as more inclusive. Next. This is my last slide. So here the design logic is to inspire and instill biophilia in the visitor's mind. And I come full circle here from my opening one, opening slide. I'm sure with lots of passion and a little compassion, the students can come up with wonderful, imaginative and innovative design ideas. My best wishes to them and thanks to everyone for listening. Over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for sharing all these wonderful examples. I, I hope the, the student participating here can really get some cues and can inspire them for their design. I would now like to invite our next speaker, uh, Ms. Moshi Joshi. She is an architect and a teacher leading the award-winning award design practice Space Matters in New Delhi. Ms. Joshi's professional and academic works reflect her strong base in the environmental, social, and political concerns of urbanism. She has taught architectural design and theory for over a decade at the School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi. And she has been a visiting faculty at the Urban Ecological Planning Program at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, Norway. She represents the International Committee for Conservation, in India, she's the advisor board member at Asian Network of Industrial Heritage based out of Taiwan and is an expert member at Central Zoo Authority. She is an expert in the field of industrial heritage and the curator to complex multi stakeholder projects that require an empathetic and interdisciplinary approach, particularly those in the field of urban ecology and disaster resilience. 
Through her work, Ms. Joshi makes a case for architecture to become a reflexive, collaborative and interdisciplinary practice. Over to you, ma'am. Thanks, Gargi. Thank you, all of you, for inviting me here, Sonali Ji, your team, and uh, Gargi. Thank you to the speakers who've come before me. I'm glad you covered a lot of ground because uh, to admit, uh, uh, design of zoos is not something that I do, and this came as a, uh, a bit of a daunting task to say something in 10 minutes about a subject that uh, I haven't uh, engaged myself in either practically or through uh, teaching. But then I thought, um, you know, so what can we say and uh, how do how to talk to students of architecture who are interested in looking at this uh, design project that CZA is uh, uh, creating and I spoke to some of them and they said, uh, well, uh, you know, we are just learning how to design for humans and we can barely manage that. How do we design for animals? It's not our field. We've never been taught that. And I said, okay, there's something there. And then uh, this whole current context of uh, living through a pandemic, uh, looking at what's happening around us in Delhi. Um, I thought these two were basically the triggers for me to put together a little bit of a conversation on uh, what I think is a useful bridge for architects to consider how they can be, you know, good architects to uh, people who are not humans. So um, I am going to speak a little about my experience of working with trees in an urban situation and I how I think trees can be good bridges to think about other creatures especially for architects who are in the business of creating dwelling. Let's start with an urban tree. So um, let me just turn on the presentation. Okay. I hope you can see the screen. Yes, yes, ma'am, we can. Uh, on the cover, uh, is it full now? Yeah, on the cover yeah. is one of my favorite trees at uh, IGNCA uh, in central Delhi, which is uh, what people call Kahani tree. So every year we have this festival where children can sit under this tree and listen to stories during the Bukaru festival. And it's really a beautiful site and it's also an endangered site now that uh, IGNC is going to be demolished for the Central Vista project. So um, I thought, how do we speak to architects about uh, trees, biodiversity, animals, when really our teaching and our education has largely been guided by canons which don't see people and trees very much. So uh, when we are taught architecture and design in India, a lot of things that we constantly refer to uh, are the Western utopias. And you're talking about Zootopia here. And I said, how do we create a, you, you know, a utopia for zoos uh, when there is something terribly wrong with our imagination of uh, you know, perfect cities and places to live. And these are some of them. You've, you're familiar with these are canons from Corbusier to F Frank Lloyd Wright. There's a, on top, you see Archigram's walking city. It's got a lot of stuff. There are a lot of fantastic ideas there, but uh, people and trees, um, we don't see them very much. So we build like this. And through our training spoken and in unspoken ways, we are taught to put the building as an artifact, as an object, which has to be cleared of a large foreground from which it can be appreciated. And people really, you know, are ornamental, if I can say the same way we look at trees. And this has, uh, I thought this was a, this is an interesting way to question uh, what we have learned, how we approach uh, this, uh, a site, or a project at hand where, as architects, because somewhere very uh, deep down in our consciousness is an idea to remove all of this. These are sort of uh, uh, superfluous things uh, and design very sculptural, gigantic, monolithic objects uh, as buildings. And in this kind of an imagination, it's hard to uh, locate our own selves, a sense of scale uh, and a sense of beauty, which comes from many other things uh, which, which are not concrete. And um, there's a direct implication of this imagination to what we see on ground. And this was yesterday. And when I saw this, I said, okay, this is really what I'm going to start with. This is Nehru place. People who are familiar with Delhi drove past yesterday and had to really take a U-turn to come back and see that all the trees <clears throat> have been removed 
from these large parking lots of Nehru Place because they were dead. And uh, so apparently served no purpose. And this is how it looked last afternoon. Just a few stumps, most of them gone, a few heavily pruned. And uh, the parking is completely naked. The buildings look ghastly. There is no shade for the guys who, you know, the people who were sitting and making a living under these trees or people who are parking their cars because somebody thought that we must get rid of dead trees. And this is a larger problem because not only do we not see them, we see them as useless and we see that they don't cater to any of our needs. Uh, what dead trees might actually be, be doing, and all of you here are familiar with this, is the several other things that they cater to for other creatures, even when they are dead. Although, I mean, a lot of these trees which have gone were not dead, but even dead trees are sites for birds, uh, for small creatures, they are sites, they do service to the soil that they hold together. So, I mean, without going deeper into this, what we imagine as an encumbrance uh, in an urban situation starts with removal of trees and it's now finding a lot more force in the pandemic. We need wood to burn our dead. You know, we need space for redevelopment and uh, slowly, you know, one by one, tree by tree, this was last year, just common sites in South Delhi. Uh, you see a house here to the right, uh, which has got these old neem trees and then just the house next door where the builders have built the new uh, multi-floor uh, dwelling units, the trees have gone. Uh, this is close to my office in Vasan Kunj, the old DDA flats uh, beautifully integrated with the old Gulmoha trees and now they are gone. Just a few houses down you see replaced by parking lots and also by palm trees. And we are doing this everywhere. Dhire dhire, all the homes are sites where we, you know, all our all our colonies, one by one, we are getting rid of this. And uh, of course, there are reasons that we are able to, uh, you know, put to this need. But this is what's happening. And uh, Vasant Kunj and Hoskas are, of course, affluent colonies. But the most of Delhi looks like this today. And <clears throat> The trees that we have, they are really um, threatened too. Uh, that's a photograph from a Defense Colony during uh, rains two years ago. You're all familiar with sites of heavy pruning during winters because dhoop nahi aari hai, and trees which have been completely built over, um, you know, along the street. And, uh, you know, these are just very common things that we're doing to these, you know, homes of animals. I know this is outside the ambit of zoos, but how do we start thinking of zoos when all around us, homes and the architecture that holds biodiversity is greatly under threat? Um, this is from a study that I'd done several years ago, and this is Sangam Vihar, one of the densest neighborhoods in Delhi. And uh, look at the number of trees, you can count them. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, you know, this, I've done this for uh, school children, for a presentation several years ago, I don't need to tell you guys, architects, especially here, students, the value of trees and green spaces, but this is really the reality. So what we need to do, and this came uh, from, these are not my words, uh, this is from somebody who runs a very active NGO in Delhi, uh, who's constantly advocating this new illness that he calls tree blindness. And I think this is what we need to be treated for. We need to start seeing that there is more life than the space that we are claiming for our own dwelling units around us. And trees are the beginning of that discussion. Um, just this second part of the presentation where I want to um, put you know, across some of my own works where uh, nature is not just something that we are able to preserve or bring into buildings and do this kind of a dual relationship between buildings versus trees, but it's something really, you know, of a life force as an inspiration that we use uh, in our practice to generate good design. It's also, I mean, in this pandemic, it's a place for refuge. It's a place where you, you know, you long to be for your own mental health. And uh, so many of us are kept uh, sort of afloat with our little home gardens. So just putting together a few of uh, 
projects and few uh, instances where this has been really the driving force behind our work. This are uh, the first project here. This is uh, the currently under construction at Bihar Sharif. It's the second uh, temple for the Baha'is in India. This is in Bihar and a form that is a site that is sacred, a building that's going to be the house of worship, but generated from the geometries that we see around us. Um, more literally to work with trees when you're presented with a small site and uh, a tree in the middle of it, it's possible very much to work with them, to bring them in, to integrate, to build here in this case, a mud house in <clears throat> Palampur with a sedar tree right in the middle of the bedroom. There are also far more larger, more active sort of landscapes that we work with. This is a site in Kumau, uh, working with the community in uh, Champawat to rewild and you know how degraded our Himalayan landscapes are now. And it's amazing what small amount of time and community action can do and the photos at this, these two photos are just six months apart uh, from a long term project that we've been doing in Kumau called Kumau Build. Uh, it's available online. And the idea is to look at all these questions of habitat and how do how can architectural practice integrate them? So it's both about plantation, but and, you know, reclamation of this of this land, but also to revive old techniques which depend on uh, these sites, both for inspiration, but also for, let's say, woodcraft here. How can we integrate this, uh, these communities into their, uh, um, into these, um, you know, in, with these sites? So how do we create small homestays? And I mean, basically, how do we work with what we have instead of building new stuff? At some point in the practice, we said, you know, the hills don't need more construction. They don't need new big buildings. We need to see what we have. And as somebody has said several times over, the greenest building is the one that exists. Can we use that in some uh, way? And I think that has been the groundwork for thinking uh, in, in more ecological terms for a practice that is essentially, I mean, essentially architectural work can be extremely violent. It can be extremely, uh, uh, you know, detrimental to the ecology. So uh, given that this is what we do as architects and uh, as one of the speakers before me said that we are basically trying to divide spaces, how do we move beyond that to repair? How do we move beyond that to restore? And uh, that's really been the, these have been the questions with us now over the last five to seven years increasingly to change the course of our practice. And not to say that we don't make, you know, residences, high-end residences in the middle of cities, but it's also possible, and this is for students, again, when you design something in 3D, it all looks very cool. What happens when there's a tree in front of it? Can we save that? I mean, it's, it's, it's both design, but it's also persuasion that it finally stays. And it can stay, and it can also be celebrated. This is another site, uh, an office site, where uh, uh, architectural interventions can celebrate this nature and literally, if I can say, bring it in and to create that sense that we are not the only people here. In more uh, green, uh, well, like a greenfield sites, this is Ashoka University, didn't have many trees, it's still a new campus. Is it possible to create the feeling of shade, the light and shade through the use of jalis here? So again, inspiration is, where do you want to be when you want to sit together in groups as a student? Do you want to sit under a tree? How do we do that? How do we capture that quality architecturally? Um, you know, in our work. And while there are not too many uh, trees here at this point, uh, and the campus is fairly um, built up, these kinds of things keep coming back. Hopefully it will be overgrown in some time and look more like another school that I will talk about. But meanwhile, this is Angan, a small Anganwari for the Delhi government we've done a couple of years ago. Again, trying to skirt the design around existing trees. So you see in that photo, in the first large photo, somebody's climbed up the ladder, there's a tree right behind him, and we're trying to make picture windows, bring the kids in from the mohalla, and also bring in other ways, this sense of being with other creatures. So 
these are gond artists uh, painting with the kids from the mohalla these uh, small miniature artworks uh, in the anganwadi so these are small things but it uh, makes in some way a thread uh, that runs across our work because we constantly refer back to it today when we're talking about cities being sites of such um, i mean such pain and such violence such inequality what can we do to think of them in better ways uh, is really stuff that we have to think about and that's uh, so the celebration whether or not it's we can plant trees or we're designing zoos we are not this here here is a is a paramedical college in Haryana where the inspiration is from the lotus uh, leaves and you see the fluted columns are an inspiration from there and now on the larger the image that you see here uh, reinterpreted by a Madhubani artist for a calendar that we had done two years ago and uh, these are ways to constantly come back to this to say that you know we are not the only ones here uh, there's more to this. There are more layers to this. There's more depth to this. Uh, perfectly concrete building here. There are hardly any trees, so to say. But there are layers to this kind of these histories, uh, these celebrations that we can put in. Um, and also, wherever we can, just build less new stuff, as I said before. This is the cultural uh, center for the French embassy in Delhi uh, and an old, old building that hadn't seen literally the light of day in several decades. It was very dark and dingy. How to restore it and make it into a perfectly modern um, office, a cultural center, uh, without breaking anything of the old building. And I'm very proud of this project because it needed a lot of persuasion uh, with the client and also a lot of exploration to open up this old building, discover you know vaulted ceilings, discover things which were which seemed unrepairable at some point, but to try and integrate that into a new design. And uh, again, wherever we are offered and wherever we can, we push build less. So this is a old Portuguese house bought by a client in Goa, and we said. We're not going to build more. Let's let's redo. Let's let's bring it back to life. Let's add more interventions, but let's keep it as we receive it as much as we can. So this is a this is secluded in Goa. Uh, there are also terribly urban projects like this one, a school which had hardly any open space. It had hardly any greens. It was a huge cause of worry for us. How do we talk about? Uh, I mean, what is going to happen to children in a school with very few trees and so we said uh, the photo that you see in the center is uh, from the time the school was just built it was it's an existing building in the in south delhi and the two photos on the sides are uh, after two monsoons and you see the entire facade uh, which is basically a you know a, a something that again something somebody said today how time you have to factor in time in design and this is what happens two monsoons down the entire facade is grown over and it's beautiful. There's nothing better we could have done to a concrete block uh, in the middle of Delhi for children. Um, and then, you know, once you have these uh, sites, a lot more learning is possible. And that conversation that we are not the only ones we are building for here is possible. This is a very, uh, it's a tough and a long drawn project of ours in Bhopal at the site of the Union Carbide factory, which is uh, polluted. Uh, it's been abandoned. It has these industrial relics. And uh, the idea here is to, again, work with the soil and work with the existing trees as the resilient trees that have survived these, you know, almost four decades of uh, chemical pollution and to use them to reclaim the soil and to uh, revitalize this toxic uh, soil and water. So here we work with uh, scientists. We work with a technique called photo, uh, phytoremediation to clean up the soil and give it back as an urban park and uh, seems very simple, but uh, the potential of stuff like this has has not really been explored in design in landscape, but it has tremendous potential both aesthetically and both from the point of view of education. And uh, that's really also what we're looking at in zoo sites, right? We're looking at um, very urban sites which need to encourage the diversity both in terms of uh, you know uh, audience uh, young people old people etc but also uh, biodiversity 
And that is, uh, this is something that we are working with uh, at a larger scale. So just to capture sort of the various responses which are coming from this deep love, which has now moved from trees to soil for me personally, and to look at how architecture can do less harm. And uh, I would say that's something I would invite, you know, architecture students to look at more closely in their work. Uh, this is a national zoological park. I've sat through certain design interventions uh, by ar architects um, last year where they are talking about, you know, how we can make the zoo better, how we can redesign this. But really, when you zoom out, this is one of the largest continuous urban greens that we have in Delhi today. And it's also one of the most historic sites by the Yamuna that we have. Um, it's also important to know that it's terribly endangered because development, you know, larger buildings, um, new projects, uh, expressways, underpasses are cutting through all around this site. And we need to look at this as something that can give back more than just the zoo to the city. So my invitation is to consider these sites not as you know isolated sites, but as something which belongs to the city. And most zoo sites I have seen over the last year during our presentation that sees a day are so valuable, whether it's about historic value, they have beautiful old buildings, also beautiful old trees, but they also occupy a large amount of area. And it should be possible to look at their value in the you know, overall development of paradigm that we, we have, uh, I mean, that, that uh, exists. So uh, I would invite you to look at, to find clues of how you would respond to this project and how you would reconsider designing zoos. And you know, to, uh, from all of these ideas, just zoom out and consider that there are more people to house and dwell when you design uh, as an architect. So, yeah, that's all. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Thank you so much, ma'am, for pointing out this valuable point. Yes, it has been going for a round of discussion that zoos are important open space or this uh, green space in our city. And we keep forgetting we have kind of regulations set for airports where we, you know, we have certain dimensions of the meter where we can't build, but for zoos, we haven't said that. And this is something that you have pointed out. It's really something we should look at. The future architects uh, planners should look at. Uh, I will now open the platform for a panel discussion. I will pose a question and request inputs from all the speakers individually. I'll start with uh, Piyush, Mr. Piyush. Uh, so the question for the panel is how design can help to obtain resilience in zoos specifically in this present pandemic situation you can give like one advice or suggestion uh, to the our participants who are watching this webinar then what would be right thank you so i think um, zoos in some ways are as susceptible or as vulnerable to pandemics as human societies but they do have certain advantages in the sense that they typically do have a veterinary setup, uh, they have quarantine, they have facilities to separate animals that are unwell. Um, so from that perspective, I think to uh, start interacting with uh, veterinary uh, vets and talking to people who are actually managing zoos in terms of staff on ground, uh, because often it is the field staff that's at most risk in zoos when they're managing uh, animals and care. I think that would really give insights into how students can actually uh, integrate some of their concerns in the way we design. And it's probably an area which is slightly specialized, so there's that much more reason to engage with it and learn. And the same would also be applicable actually to a wider gamut of design that is going to come up in the future. They all will have to be sort of resilient to pandemics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Deepta, uh, if you're there, can you just answer like the same question, how design can help to obtain resilience in zoos? Yes, um, I actually have a slightly different take on it from, uh, from yeah. Piyush, um, in the sense that I think, you know, resilience is really about um, 
is about, it's not about resisting. It's actually, for me, uh, I believe it's more about moving with and synchronizing with things that are changing already. So how do you, I mean, in order to be resilient, for example, if we fall ill, our body develops resilience from falling ill, not from resisting it. So in the same way, when we think about zoos or interpretation centers um, um, and these kinds of uh, very complex uh, and dynamic places, can, mm. can we build in change into the design, not just in the process, but into the actual physical materiality of the design? So being adaptive is really important, um, you know, not having anything permanent uh, per se uh, would be really important as well. Um, and just to uh, be a little controversial, I think vulnerability, for example, is a really interesting and positive idea as opposed to something that is seen in negative light. Because when you're vulnerable, you're susceptible to change as well and to adapt to new things. Um, and so I think um, in the sense of even in the pandemic, can we construct spatial organizations or experiences that are adaptive to change, um, to pandemic, post-pandemic, different pandemic, uh, all kinds of situations, really. So it's a, how do we sort of move with change and respond? So the idea is you sort of have to start to read change before um, responding to it in order to be resilient. So that's my take on it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shuchandra? Yeah, could you repeat the question? Because I got yes. disconnected. Yes. Uh, how design can help to obtain resilience in zoos? specifically in the present pandemic situation, if you can give at least one suggestion to the participants who are watching this webinar. Oh, okay. In my view, as I said, zoos are green infrastructures and they deal with biotic and abiotic components of ecosystem. And uh, hence the internal and external subsystems that are dependent on the zoos uh, these uh, uh, the key should be you know learning from nature allow and adopt its uh, processes in design landscapes inside the zoo through outside in ecosystem restoration and inside out that is biophilia so i'll go back to my uh, the you know the content of my slides which i mentioned that ecosystem restoration and biophilia these are the two ways i think zoos can be developed as a more resilient other than that, of course, you know, if uh, I consider at a micro level, then designing with nature and uh, um, uh, I guess less is more because uh, to do more with less resources, it's what uh, probably will uh, we have to learn. All of us, not only zoos, but all infrastructures and all of us in all our systems. That's Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Monshi, ma'am, if you can. Um, well, uh, I don't have a very specific answer, but what I want to say is that the training that architects receive as students is extremely diverse. It's very, it teaches you to work between different disciplines. It teaches you to uh, triangulate between qualitative and quantitative uh, data. You use your senses to, uh, you know, to, to, to process information. So, you know, architects are well trained to observe and to uh, analyze and intervene. I just think that they need to be, uh, they need to be more familiar with the, with the environment of a zoo. Uh, so for students who are here, um, my invitation is that you should be going out there and doing what you do in a, in a let's say a, what you would do in a housing site and think about the residents of the zoo and uh, use your architectural training, the methods that you have as architects to see where you can, uh, how you can intervene better. So I would say seeing would be crucial for me. Go and experience and go and see. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you for this wonderful session. Uh, we will now take two minutes break, allowing the guest speakers to leave. I would like to thank all the speakers for their time and their valuable insights. I will request the viewers to stay online as I will be making the housekeeping announcement regarding the competition and then steer a walkthrough of the competition website and application link. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. So to, can you see my screen? Uh, so to begin with, I would like to inform everybody that the deadline is on 7th of June at 11.59 p.m. So we would request you to not to rely on the final one hour. We would request you to kindly submit prior to that to just to avoid any kind of Internet glitches. So once you go to the m.gov.in, uh, you, you will see the standing banner. Once you click the apply now, it will take you to this page. This is the official competition website. Uh, where you have all the design briefs. Uh, so this is the standing banner. This is where the competition brief and detail you will find it. The criteria, the contact details, the uh, the participants. What are the submit uh, deliverables are required for the competition? At the bottom of the page, you will see three tabs: the competition files, guidelines, and apply now. In the competition files, you will see all the DWG files, all the relevant uh, PDFs, drawings, images that you might be requiring for uh, the, for the design proposals. Uh, under the guidelines, you have the detailed brief and what are the things you are required to do for your design. Uh, when when you click apply now, it will take you to this page. It will take you to the Zootopia challenge page where you have to once you put the register. So you first before submitting, you have to do the registration. So category name qualification. Once you register, you become the official uh, participant of the Zootopia challenge. And once you register, you can log in and do your submission. I would repeat again, please do not be late. Do not rely on the final one hour kindly submitted prior to that. And for any kind of questions uh, that you have related to this uh, competition kind of uh, on the brief, you can obviously send your queries to aim.challenges at gov.in. So there we are. And with this, uh, I would like to end our session and I would uh, tell everybody like what the participants who have joined best of luck for the submission. And we would we will all looking forward to your wonderful uh, design proposals. Thank you so much. We can end the session now.